Welcome back, everyone. We hope you enjoyed the break. And we're not going to speak too long. Introducing our next speaker right away, it's going to be Karim Harbit, a dear friend and trainer colleague. Karim, it's great to have you with us. Karim has uh, almost decades in plural of product development experience. He looks younger than he is. Um, Karim is also a fellow uh, Scrum trainer, agile leadership educator. He serves on the Scrum Alliance Board of Directors, and uh, both Zuzi and I are super excited to have him with us. He will share with us his, insi his insights on uh, transforming businesses and actually making them become better at business agility. He wrote a book recently. Um, I'm reading it right now. Uh, so far, I can highly recommend it. Let's see what happens uh, after I finish it. And he'll share of, uh, some of those insights with us today. Karim, handing over to you. Thank you so much, Saurabh, um, and thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm excited to be uh, to finally make it on. So uh, uh, let's, uh, let's get going. I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to run through a quick presentation. I try and keep it to about 30 minutes, but you know, me, and, me and time boxes, um, those years as a scrum master didn't help me uh, get any better at that. Um, but I'll, I'll do my best, um, and then we'll, we'll leave some time for, for questions. Um, so, so this is the six enablers of business agility. So it's, uh, it's what the book is called, and it's, it's a model that I've been evolving over many years. So I'm just going to walk you through that quickly. Um, High-level topics we'll cover. I, I want to talk a bit about the case for business agility. Uh, not, hopefully not in a way that, we, that you've seen it before, put my spin on it. I'm going to talk about the six enablers of business agility, what they are, why, why I chose those six and where all the things that you think are missing might go. Um, and, and then um, three is a bit of a cheat because I'm, of course, not going to tell you how to set yourselves up uh, for a successful transformation. Um, that's going to take a lot longer than the five minutes I'll dedicate to it. However, um, some things that I've seen be useful, um, some small hints and tips when, when using this that I, I will share with you and a tool that I created to help with that. This is me. If you really want to see that, you can go back and read it later, but uh, uh, I won't dwell on that. Um, I do want to dwell on the, the woolly mammoth, though, which you might think is a strange place to start my talk. If we look back through history, uh, there have been a number of animals over the years that have been on a completely different scale to what we see today. Uh, the uh, Apparently, there was a, a two-ton wombat that used to live out in, uh, in Australia. Uh, the woolly mammoth, of course, um, sort of similar size to our elephants today, so it's so not ginormous. Um, but, but if we go back even further, we have, of course, the giant dinosaurs, Apatosaurus, Diplodocus. These, uh, anyone who's been to sort of, uh, the, the museum where they, they reconstruct the skeletons of those things will know just how enormous those things were. Way bigger than anything we have today, if we exclude the whales because they, well, they live underwater. It's cheating. Now, the question is, why, why so big, right? And, and there's, there's a ton of evidence to suggest that there's a real competitive advantage to being, to being big, right? Um, you can fight off your competitors when competing for resources um, and the, the, the ability to mate. Uh, you can cover large distances to find resources but much more easily if you're bigger. You tend to be stronger as well. You can fight off predators and you can catch prey and you carry more resources around with you so you are more likely to survive the lean times. So over the years, of course, we natural selection uh, allows us to get bigger and bigger and bigger over time. And if you go back a few million years, our ancestors were averaged about four foot high. We, we are significantly bigger than that, right? So there is this uh, this this phenomenon whereby mammals and reptiles, in particular, get bigger. It's a competitive advantage. However, it's not always a competitive advantage. It's a competitive advantage when the business climate. <laughs> It's a competitive advantage when the environment is stable, right? When, when you've got reasonably stable uh, weather conditions and environments and food supplies, then it's a competitive advantage. But if we go back to we go back 66 million years to the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event, this is where an asteroid slammed into around about the Gulf of Mexico, set off a chain of events that wiped out 75% of life on Earth as plants and animals. And if you study the animals that survived that impact, that dramatic change in the environment, what you'll find is most of those animals were about 25 kilograms and below, almost all of them, in fact. That's 55 pounds to, uh, to our friends across the Atlantic. Uh, 25 kilograms or below, 
And most of them were about cat size and below, right? So small creatures survived. They could forage for food, find shelter, reproduce more quickly. So what was the competitive advantage when the environment was stable became a liability when they needed to adapt quickly. And those smaller, more nimble creatures uh, who, were, who were struggling before suddenly now had the ability to survive and thrive where those big dinosaurs literally couldn't. I find this an interesting parallel uh, because we see, of course, exactly the same thing playing out in the business world. So I'm going to talk you through, this is, this is a thread that tends to run through a lot of my work, and I know um, a lot of people talk about this, you use these terms. Um, organizations ultimately are, are undertaking both of these things, exploiting and exploring in, uh, in various uh, combinations. Uh, let me talk you through what they are. If you have a product, a service, a business model that is proven, and you just need to execute against it, right? We call that exploiting. It's like you might make some incremental improvements. You might focus on efficiency of delivering that, right? But you're not doing anything dramatically new, right? You're able to make plans, make predictions, uh, and you're able to, to have a reasonable level of certainty because you have past data. So if you take a pharmaceutical company, for example, making a drug, you know, they're making some pills, they just need to manufacture them, package them, distribute them around the world, engage in marketing and selling them too. All right, and they know how to do that. So no experimentation needed. If we look at the explore side of things, that's when organizations are creating new knowledge, new products, new services, new business models. It's highly creative, highly experimental, Right. You focus on doing new things, things you've never done before, and therefore making predictions and plans is incredibly difficult. If you go back to our pharmaceutical company, uh, um, this would be when you are doing R&D on creating new drugs. Um, and a little bit of searching tells me that on average, um, 25,000 compounds being investigated will lead to 25 clinical trials, which will lead to five products making it to market, of which one will make significant money. Right, so if you're trying to pick the winners uh, without making mistakes, you're gonna have a difficult time doing that, right? And so these are very different things. This is doing what we do already, executing versus creation, right? And all organizations do some combination of that. Now, this is important because if we go back to the late 19th, early 20th century, all the way through to the mid 20th century, the vast majority of what organizations did was exploit what they had. Right. There wasn't a whole load of innovation going on in terms of business models, products and services. Um, there was invention going on. Um, that's a little separate. Right? But if you take the Model T, for example, right, Ford were able to succeed uh, with the Model T because of an innovation in how they delivered it, the moving assembly line. To assemble those 3,000 parts used to take them 12 hours before they put that in place. It took them 90 minutes afterwards. It used to sell for $850 beforehand, it sold for $300 afterwards. This efficiency saving, these focus on productivity and efficiency and driving down costs of what they already did was what made them one of the biggest car companies on the planet. Right? By 1927, one in every two cars sold was a Model T, which always blows my mind because if they were, really were all black, how on earth did anybody ever find their car? But that's a whole different story, right? Uh, so organizations are designed, well, organizations grew out of this period, right? And in that period, it was exploiting what you had, not exploring the new that made you successful. So most organizational structures from the production line to functional hierarchies to Tayloristic management processes are all focused around that model, around worshiping at the altar of efficiency and doing what you already do. And very few learn to do the other side. And that can work very well, of course, like with the dinosaurs, when the environment is stable, when the business climate is reasonably stable, when there isn't high competition, uh, when, when uh, you don't have high, high levels of technological change the whole time and all this interconnectedness. But of course, uh, most of us will be familiar with the term VUCA. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. I'm not going to go over this too much. That's been probably been done many times. Um, however, volatility refers to the pace of change now. Right? How quickly the world changes, how quickly new technologies are adopted, how quickly new organizations spring up. 
It's a different order of magnitude than we've ever seen before. Uncertainty response, uh, talks about how, how hard is it to make predictions about the future, right? Do we know what's gonna happen in a year's time or not? Go back to Henry Ford's time, he could take, he could take a five to 10 year view we look at where we are now, it's not so easy to do that, all right? Particularly difficult at the moment, but even the, the pandemic aside, uncertainty was everywhere. Complexity was about interconnectedness of markets, of customer segments, of, uh, of regions, of technologies, all right? We have social media and everything's just interconnected now uh, and things are much more difficult to get a handle on the complexity of the work you know, it's often used as one of the, the explanations for, for agile approaches. And ambiguity is our ability to, uh, well, the fact that we can make many, many interpretations on the data we have. We have lots of data. We have more data than we've ever had. But there are many interpretations of it, and we see that every day, right? It's no good having a thousand dots and, and someone saying, you have all the dots. How did you not join them together when only 50 of them are relevant? Okay, so ambiguity is the difficulty in getting a handle on what's happening today. And this has fundamentally changed the game. You know, you've probably seen charts like this before. This is the average tenure on the S&P 500 index. So if you entered the S&P 500 index in 1960, you could expect to be on there for an average of 61 years. That has gone down and down and down. This, is, uh, this was the figures in 2012, but it hasn't changed much since then. 15 years now. Why? because the world changes more quickly. And what that says to me is this. The stuff on the left exploits stuff. We, do, we get that. We've inherited that knowledge from leaders, from gurus that, that have been around uh, during that industrial revolution time. Frederick Taylor, Henry Ford, we're really good at that stuff. That's been passed down. Even people who were born in the 50s still have that mentality. Right? These are people who are still leading organizations. You've done an MBA, you probably spent the vast majority of your time on the left there. However, it's now as important to be able to explore, to innovate, to create the new, as important as it is to execute efficiently against what you're doing now. And most organizations, because they are structured, because they are built from the ground up to exploit, they struggle to do that. Because we take tools and techniques that work over there, like efficiency, and we bring them over to try and innovate, and they fail over and over again because traditional cultures and structures and policies that work on the left don't work on the right. And then we find ourselves just having to pay over the odds to acquire new companies because we can't innovate ourselves. And for me, this is the essence of business agility. The VUCA that we've seen is the 21st century extinction event now. That's fundamentally changed the business climate. So that just exploiting that once was enough, now no longer enough. We need to explore and exploit. We need to become ambidextrous organizations. Uh, and this for me really is, is the, the sort of what business agility is about. Can we respond quickly, easily, cheaply to innovate, to reinvent ourselves whilst keeping the lights on? So that's a bit of context. Um, I know I want to talk to you uh, about the six enablers of business agility, but first, a little quote from a, a good friend and a mentor of mine, Mike Beadle, before we lost him way, way before his time. Um, he used to say this all the time, easier to grow a unicorn than to transform a dinosaur. Now, if you think about it, how many unicorns are grown every year uh, spring up this like, billion dollar market cap companies privately owned, right? lots of them. How many big transformations of organizations that operated in a traditional way to organizations that were ambidextrous and achieved real business agility. How many of those do we see? I can think of probably higher in China. Um, to a certain extent, Microsoft under Satya Nadella um, and one or two smaller organizations, all right, but um, certainly nowhere near as many as we see unicorns. So maybe Mike had a point there. It's difficult and we'll talk about why. This is the analogy I like to use. If you put an, an Android app on an iPhone, not that you would want to, but if you wanted to, it would fail. Nothing wrong with the app itself. I'm sure it's very well designed. There's nothing wrong with the iPhone. It's incredibly well designed. Um, but yet there's a compatibility issue between those two things. You're trying to ins install something on the wrong operating system. Now, 
If we try and do the same thing here, except we cross it out and we try and install new ways of working, processes, practices, frameworks, tools, Scrum, design thinking, Jira, whatever it is, and we try and put that on a traditional organizational culture, traditional structures, the hierarchy, the policies. If we try and install that there, it will also fail. Not because there's anything wrong with those ways of working and not because there's anything wrong per se with those organizations, but there is a compatibility issue. So we need to deal with the underlying organizational operating system first. And that's what the six enablers is about. So this is just really uh, highlighting what we talked about there. And I spend a lot of time teaching these things and I go into organizations and over and over again, they say, can you come and teach us Scrum? And I look around and realize Scrum is the least of the things you need to learn right now. Like it's a good, it's a good framework, right? But you've got to fix so much other stuff before there's any chance of that working, be it Scrum, Kanban, less user stories, you know, just writing better user stories does not fix your organization. Neither does installing Jira or any of those things. So what does? And over the years, you know, I've, I've spent so many, uh, so many of years working with big, messy transformations, big banks, big telcos, loads of different organizations, and I see the same problems. And so, uh, and, and as a consulting framework, I thought, right, let me try to create a, a kind of a, a list of stuff that if you miss any of these things, you're probably going to struggle based on the on the years uh, that I've seen and all of the mistakes that I've seen made and. Uh, and that, that's how I ended up creating what I call the six enablers of business agility. And I'm just going to run through these one by one. Because um, for me, the ways of working, we touch that stuff. We're good at that stuff. We know there's a lot written about Scrum and all of these ways of working. right? But there's not so much written about the underlying organizational operating system, which makes it up, which allows it to work. And so uh, for me, uh, my work in the last certainly uh, five or six or seven years has been really helping organizations to try and understand how to create these organizational operating systems. So uh, I will power through uh, each of these six just to give you a flavor of what they are, right? But uh, there's obviously no, no detail that we can go into right now. Um, so I'll start with leadership and management. And I do that because everything starts with leadership and management. If, if, if where there isn't a real mindset shift among the people leading the organization, if they don't go first, uh, from what I've seen, almost nothing else changes because they're the ones that set the tone for the culture and everything else. Right? So we've got to get away from this command and control that, you know, this Frederick Taylor micromanagement, the positional authority, which is telling people how to do their jobs, leads, leads to widespread disengagement, slow, bad decision making. And right, we need to start moving towards uh, the, the kind of leader that articulates the inspiring vision and empowers others to make it a reality. That invests in the growth of others, but also teams such that they can respond to whatever strategic challenge comes around the corner right, and relentlessly decentralizes decision making. You know, is a, there's a big game coming up on Sunday. I don't know if you've noticed uh, England doing rather better than they normally do. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to enjoy it while it lasts. Um, but if you take the, uh, the analogy of a football team, right, imagine one football team whose manager made every decision for them and another football team that was allowed to make contextual decisions on the ground in a decentralized way. Okay? Right? One would run rings around the other. Uh, and so this is what we mean, you know, setting the direction and then allowing people with the information to make that decision. Right? We've seen this in many different contexts. Right? So at a high level, these are the kind of leadership changes we need to see. Uh, and, and hopefully someone can help those leaders on that journey. Very much linked. And by the way, these, these things are not mutually exclusive. Uh, there, there are things that are, you know, how leaders behave will impact culture and so many other things. Right? There's no clean way of drawing a distinction, however. I did my best. All right. So for me, the culture of the organization is key. And it comes up as uh, either number one or number two barrier to greater agility in every version one state of agile report, right? It's just always there because we have a culture of control and conformance and fear and secrecy and blame. And this is not conducive to creative, collaborative knowledge work. So we need to change that to one of trust and transparency. And all of these things we see here, openness, experimentation, and, and, and the things I say to people when they're trying to transform culture is that you, you of course can't change culture directly any more than you can change a shadow on the wall directly. And you change a shadow by changing the thing that causes the shadow. It's the way people behave 
that leads to the culture. So in order to change a culture, you need to change behaviors. But of course, we don't get to change everybody's behaviors either. So I think for me, there are five levers we have at our control uh, as managers to, con to influence behaviors which will lead to that culture. And that is the structures of our organization, the policies, the rules we put in place, the, the uh, incentives that we set, right? the metrics that we track, and then the behaviors you exhibit as a leader. Structures, policies, incentives, metrics, and leadership behaviors for me, real levers that you have in order to set that culture. But we must create that environment. Moving on now to structure. Now, this is kind of the, the hard architecture of your organization. Right? However agile your mindset is, however great a leader you are, if you are trying to be nimble and nip in and out of uh, a slalom race and one's on an oil tanker and one is on a speedboat, I mean, there's no way that the oil tanker can compete here. So how you structure your organization is incredibly important. And it's, one, it's the one enabler you have direct control over as well. So it's very powerful in that respect. Of course, the top-down hierarchies and functional silos with an army of uh, PMO coordinating between them with very little collaboration, the focus on individual productivity rather than team-based outputs, right? All of these things are designed for efficiency. They are designed for the Model T on the moving assembly line. What they're not designed for is collaborative, creative knowledge work and innovation. In order to get that, we, of course, familiar with the cross-functional team, the self-managing team, and then networks of interconnected self-managing cross-functional teams, right? forming that team of teams or that network, right? all working towards a customer-focused outcome right? without an army of coordinators. But these people build trust and networks and relationships across those teams. Right? And it's, uh, it, it's incredibly achievable, but you've got to want to do it. And you've got to, you've got to be aware that when you sacrifice some efficiency, you gain some agility, right? So these two things tend to be at opposite ends of the spectrum. If we're trying to be efficient, we'll never be agile. The, uh, the fourth enabler here um, is people and engagement, right? I mean, you read the first, first value of the manifesto for agile software development. It will tell you individuals' interactions over processes and tools, right? But yet, we spend so little time on the people and we spend so little time with HR. HR is almost never along for the ride on these transformations, right? It's, they're ignored. And so, you know, you've got bureaucracy, compliance, rules. People are bored, right? Strict, narrow job descriptions, right? People are disengaged at a record level. I mean, 15% engagement, if you take the latest Gallup poll, right? that, that means 67% of people not engaged and then 18% of people are actively disengaged. These are awful figures. And it all comes down to people wanting to express their creativity and contribute towards something and have great relationships at work. And, and we're not allowing them to do that. We're just wasting that human potential. Okay, so changing these policies is vital as well as the, uh, the incentives to move towards individual incentives to team-based incentives to inspire that collaboration stop stack ranking, all of these things that we know are industrial revolution HR policies, get rid of them and, and evolve towards something that's gonna create that environment for creativity. Governance and funding now, it, which is the one that raises eyebrows, right? And people look at me like, governance and funding? Because they, they hear those words like they're bad things. But remember, right, the whole point of, and I don't mean corporate governance, I mean like sort of product, product governance here, is are we spending our money in the right way? Are we doing things in the right way, right? Is what we're doing aligned with our strategy, right? So just because we're used to annual budgets and projects and outputs and rigid plans and, and strict change control and business cases, all of these things, doesn't mean that's how it has to be, right? When you, we talked about the 25,000 compounds to find just one profitable drug. Well, it's the same when you're exploring products and business models, maybe not quite so drastic. But we have to kiss a lot of frogs uh, in order to find the prince. We have to fail a lot. We have to fail quickly. We have to fail cheaply. So investing in a governance process that allows us to run those small safe to fail experiments, to have adaptive plans, to realize we're not going to know everything up front, to not be tracked as conformance to the plan as your metric of success, as I was back in my project manager days and, 
I can tell you, I've been rewarded for delivering really efficiently and really effectively a whole bunch of nonsense that no one ever used, right? Because that was what, what I was incentivized to do. It makes no sense, right? So move away from focusing on defined outputs, move towards focusing on uh, business outcomes, customer focus outcomes, move away from projects, move towards products, move away from predicting up front and move towards experimenting as you go and learning as you go. And finally, uh, we have ways of working. This is the easy bit, if I'm honest, like this is this is the processes and practices and tools. Uh, this is getting your DevOps tool chain in place, your technology. This is getting design thinking teams together, scrum teams. This is the, actually making it work. But it will be so much easier to do once we've got that that underlying organizational operating system in place with those other five enablers, right? So you know, some, some high level guidance here, uh, just don't try to move away from standardization and rigid processes and, and focus on uh, conformance and just give people the freedom to, to own their processes, to improve them continually, to seek that fast feedback, to collaborate. All these things we know are incredibly effective, but, but organizations aren't designed to do. So they are the six enablers. What I wanna show you now is, um, when you're starting a, uh, a transformation, or even if you're in the middle of one, what I often see is the first thing is that quite a lot of those enablers are missed, right? And if you just ignore governance, well, nothing's going to change, right? Because you know we try and be agile, but we've got a fixed scope. I mean, it just won't work, right? So if you if you miss any off, that's a problem. So it's great to have transparency over what are we attacking, what are we not, but also. In the same way, well, you know, when, when Alex Osterwalder put together his business model canvas, it wasn't just to show you what all the elements of the business model are, it's to show you whether or not they are coherent and coordinated and consistent and, and, and how they interact with each other in a coherent way to move you towards where you want to go, right? If things are at odds, then it makes no sense. And, and I think we see the same thing in transformations. We see changes happening in different parts of the organization that do not work together in a coordinated, coherent way. And I think this is a problem. So I, I created a tool to, to sort of try and deal with that. And you know, I, I hold my hands up. I borrowed from very many other tools, um, from V2 MOM to the business model canvas to some of John Cotter's work. But you know, it works for me. Um, ultimately, we need to cover what and why, how, and then the other stuff. And I call that what else because I don't have a better name for it. Maybe you can help me out. Um, when we when we run through it, right? But uh, this is the business agility canvas that I use with organizations, right? So as you can see, we start with why, with the vision, right? Simon Sinek told us we should do that a few years ago now. Right? What are we trying to achieve? Why is this important to us? What do we value? And what are the success criteria? What, do we, what measures will allow us to know whether we've got better or not, right? I think it's really important to have those. And it's really important to decide these up front. I mean, so often I go into organizations and they're just trying to be agile. And they say, what is the vision? What, how, what does that look like to you? We were more agile, right? It doesn't mean anything. So let's get this up front. Right? Once you've got that, you can now start making sure that all the changes you make in these six enablers are coordinated and coherent and play together. And you can see when there are blanks and you can fill them in. Right? You have this up on a wall, you're all collaborating around it. All right, and, and so it's really important to make sure that everything plays together and hangs together nicely here. Again, this is super high level, of course, go into much more detail and things will evolve as you go. So it's a very iterative process. And here's the what, here's the what else all right, that I still can't find a good name for. And, and it, who, who is going to help us on this journey? Who's going to help us with training, with coaching and consultancy? What about our suppliers? Who, who needs to be on board here for the ride? What are the key risks? What could go wrong? How are we mitigating that? Who's mitigating that? And of course, what are the obstacles that are in the way right now? That's one of, uh, one of the eight reasons organizations fail in their transformation, according to Cotter, right? Not removing those obstacles. So let's get them up there. Let's get them transparent. And who owns them? Like a scrum master helps to, to resolve impediments for a team. We need someone helping to resolve obstacles uh, for the business agility transformation as well. And this is something that you'll revisit all the time. It's a great tool for collaboration. It's a great tool for alignment. It's a great tool for communication as well. Um, I found it very useful. Um, you can download this for free, by the way, plus a, a 20 page guidebook. So if you go to sixenablers.com, I'll ping you that link later, you can find that. So there we go, whistle stop tour. However, 
we talked about uh, business agility and really the fact that innovation and responsiveness now is the only way to, to survive and thrive in this high VUCA environment. Because every product, every service, every business model has a, a shelf life, right? We might not know when that's going to end. Some organizations do, they see it coming, some don't see it coming, right? So the ability to create new ones is vital now. And when you're trying to create that business agility, you must focus on all six of those enablers. You focus on one or two, you get a shallow organization, a shallow adoption. And you know, some people refer to that as doing agile rather than being agile. I don't even think you're doing agile particularly there, all right? Because nothing that you do there is aligned with the with the principles and, and values of that manifesto. So it's shallow. Create that operating system with the six enablers. And, and finally. Now, you've got to make sure that the changes are consistent, coordinated, coherent, and that it's driven by senior leadership, right? It's really important. If you talk about at a high level what we've discussed today, it's not stuff that you can change at the mid-level of the company, right? These are big structural changes, the way leaders behave, their mindset, the culture, the structures has to be driven from the top, supported from the bottom and the middle, absolutely. And... If you are interested in an assessment tool, there's an, again, sixenablers.com, there's a free assessment tool just to give you a quick snapshot of how you're doing in each of those uh, six areas. And you can download that for free. Feel, feel free to use that. It's very quick and easy to do. And of course, as Saurabh said, I uh, put my heart and soul into uh, taking uh, what's been in my head for the last seven or eight years or even longer and uh, trying to get it down in a, in a book to, to reach more people. So uh, that is out uh, as of the 1st of June. And uh, Super exciting for, to be uh, done with writing uh, and able to get my life back again. So uh, check that out if it's of interest. And that is all I wanted to say. 31 minutes is not so bad. So uh, thank you for listening. Um, and I would really love to hear your questions. Uh, we can go deeper into any of those areas if you like. Great, Karim, thank you so much. By the way, I already shared the link to the website where people can get more information about the Brilliant. book and the tools that you just shared with us. It's great to get so many like free tools that people can use. And I think the six enablers of business agility or the business agility canvas is really um, a good one, especially those that are familiar with working in, in other canvases. You'll pick it up uh, quite quickly and then um, it will be helpful to you. So while I'm waiting for people like putting their questions into the chat, I um, do have a few questions um, and maybe it's just also comments. So what I found really interesting when you were talking about the mammoth, you said that, and I'm paraphrasing, your competitive, competitive advantage today or in the past might be a liability in the future, mm. right? And, and I think it's super important to, to put this out because a lot of organizations are like, yeah, we were super successful. Look at us, we've been around for a hundred plus years and we're today even generating this amount of cash or whatever metric they take for success. But then pointing this out that yes, you were so successful, but this might not be the right competitive advantages going into the future is important. Do you have examples of organizations where you had conversations around this and how you created this awareness, it's especially with their leaders and what kind of changes that, that triggered? Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm always going on about this because you know, I'm passionate about innovation, right? But I'll, I'll start with the ones that, that we all know about, but I'll give a bit, a bit more context, right? Because you know, you know some, some organizations see it coming and are unable to respond. These are the codecs of the world, right? Who, who see digital photography coming, but don't want to disrupt their, disrupt their own business model. Now, interestingly, Fujifilm film was able to pivot, pivot into uh, cosmetics and, and other things, whereas the Kodak didn't. And I think it's because they were making so much money and, and we saw the same thing with Blockbuster. Now, the tragic thing for Blockbuster is they tried and they removed the CEO because he was investing in, in online and actually trying to create the future. And of course that was hitting the bottom line right? and the shareholders didn't like that and the board didn't like it, so out you go. All right? And so it, it, we see examples of those everywhere. Right? Those are the ones we all know, there are lots more. Um, but I've had these conversations with, with organizations. It's like, you, however successful you are right now, and the banks are, are, are the, probably the best example of this, right? They make so much money, or actually they don't make so much money these days, um, but they just don't believe they're going to be disrupted. And, and nobody really believes they're gonna be disrupted until they are. So the question is, you know, you've got this business model, are you prepared to, to disrupt yourself? 
Like, like when Steve Jobs created the iPhone, he destroyed the iPod, right? Which at the time was 50% of their revenue and bang, gone, right? Not instantly, but he killed it. And he, he thought it's better that we kill it than, than that someone else does it, right? So you're always having these conversations saying, um, okay, you're successful now. Will you be successful in three years, in five years, in 10 years, right? Um, and the answer sometimes is, I won't be here in five years or 10 years. I'll be on the beach drinking my retirement cocktails. So it's uh, it's really quite a difficult conversation to have um, or whatever you do in your retirement. I know maybe that's my view of retirement, but uh, we'll see about that. Um, um, but, but it's really quite difficult because what you're asking leaders to do is to take a big risk, right? It's a much bigger risk to act in the short term than to do nothing in the short term. And you're asking them to take a big risk it's very clear if it goes wrong that it's their fault. Whereas if they don't act, it's not clear that it's their fault and it's gonna be so long in the future anyway. Um, and so these conversations are incredibly difficult because the sensible thing from their perspective is to do nothing, is to just keep maximizing the bottom line today, retire, live a great life, and then someone else deals with the mess tomorrow when they get disru disrupted. And, and, that, and that makes it really hard. So I've had minimal success in convincing people to do it. I've had more success when they want to do it, helping them. That's the honest truth. But I know you probably got a ton of examples too, Saurabh. Yeah, I mean, it's super interesting because one of, the, one of the books, when I have these conversations with leaders, I usually refer to them one book, and it's only the paranoid survives from Andy Grove. Because I think as a leader in, in today's day and age, and you talked about VUCA briefly, and prior to you, we had Nick and Laura and Koshi also talking about VUCA. You need to be somehow paranoid. Otherwise, you're like, man, everything looks good, right? Why would I need to change anything? And the more I think about this, and maybe you can relate to this as well, and your, your, your ideas would be interesting to me, is maybe management is not even the right partner or the right level in an organization to address. Maybe it is going up to the boards of directors yeah. because depending on what they set out as goals for the, the CEO and the whole executive team, those are going to be the things that that executive team acts upon, right? Yeah. If it is about like, like maximizing cash flow today, which is all about exploit, that's what they're going to do. If it is about like building sustainable and new business model models, that's what they're going to do. Have you had like conversations on, on that level? Yeah, it's, it's interesting um, because, uh, you know, if you, if you read the, uh, the, the corporate governance code in the UK, which I, I hope that you never do, um, but if you do read the corporate governance code, because I have, um, it, what it says is uh, your, your, your mandate as a board is to ensure the long term sustainability of the organization, right? Yeah. Um, not just the short term profit, right? And by sustainability, that's as an organization, but also fr from, a, from an environmental and social impact as well, right? But, but we see so many boards putting that pressure on, I think, because ultimately, uh, boards you know, the shareholders have a big, uh, a big say in this and uh, as well, and, and shareholders tend to be more interested in the, in the short term gains. But then, um, yeah, these conversations have to happen at board level. I think you're right, Saurabh. Otherwise, the leaders don't make, you know, it takes a special kind of Elon Musk type um, or Jeff Bezos type to actually just do this because you get it uh, and have the strength to do it. Um, but we do need we do need boards of directors to be setting that context for them saying, that's great. Like they do at 3M, right? You've got to make, was it 30% of your revenue from products created in the last three to five years. I mean, that is a high, high, high level metric that's going to drive innovation if ever I've seen one, right? Because you don't have long to rest on your laurels. That's where it has to happen. You're right. Um, no, we don't often get uh, as consultants in the room with the directors at that level, unfortunately, but I think it's where we need to be when we need to be focusing our attention for sure. Yeah, and I think for all of you that are consultants out there, I, I would highly encourage from a personal experience level as well, I highly encourage to get into conversations with boards of directors, be it of small companies, large companies, to, to make sure that they really take their own mandate seriously. Every board should be thinking about the long-term success, the sustainable success of an organization. So moving away from my questions, Karim, to, to the one that Christoph is raising in the chat, what are your key learnings consulting companies to transform from exploit to explore? Are there any successful examples at all? 
that companies had managed to go from more of an exploit mindset to balancing probably between explore, explore and exploit. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, yeah, there are there, there, there are a few examples, but in my, my experience, um, I'll, I'll I'll tell you my my key learning from doing this. Right, if you try to do it as part of the standard hierarchy and culture, it almost never works. Right, because we talked about we talk about changing uh, how governance works, how how the culture operates, how the teams are structured. For me, when you have a, an organization of a certain size. You will never change the whole organization, but what you can do is uh, create a part of the organization, right? Uh, oh, GE used to do this, they would their skunk works, right? This isn't a new thing, right? Create, separate it, right? So you're close enough to leverage the capabilities and assets of the, of the company, but you're far enough away to be able to create distinct cultures, uh, create distinct policies, have a different type of leader, because you do need a different type of leader when you're in, uh, in startup mode to when you're in like just operating mode, right? Uh, and all of these things need to be designed for that context. And I think being too close to the main organization tends to go badly, right? So uh, normally a different office is advisable um, and normally just kind of some high level oversight but an arm's length relationship is, is really the way I've seen it work best. And, and um, you know, one, one place we, we did this really well, I, I started my career at uh, John Lewis, the department store based in the UK, big department store, right? Um, and then they were, when I was sort of, this is a few years back now, they were kind of just tentatively thinking about creating a website. Uh, this is that, uh, right? And, and they're, a very, uh, they're, they're a very conservative type organization, right? And I remember when the website went up, people were like, why are we wasting our money on this? We're, we're all about customer service and an in-store experience. It's kept them afloat, by the way, in the last 18 months. Um, and they literally, they hired a whole like big warehouse, right? You notice that corporate, corporate headquarters, big warehouse for the, uh, for the uh, online folk, like different dress code, different culture entirely, much more innovative. And um, that's been my key learning, right? Don't, don't get too close or you get absorbed into the, uh, uh, into the mothership and then you, then you probably won't get anywhere. Yeah. And so you mentioned oversight, and I think what, what's again important to emphasize is when you oversee that new organizational unit, the metrics you use as measures for success or failure, they, they are completely different yeah. than for your traditional business, just, just as a reminder for everyone. Yeah. So the next question comes from Ahab, and Ahab, great to have you with us. Um, He's asking, with leadership, with leadership changing very often in organizations, and we know the numbers between like three to five years for many publicly listed organizations, um, how do you see the other enablers being impacted? Changing things like culture and people behavior take longer periods of time. They do. And, and, and actually all of these things do. If you notice, most, most people, people tend to stop a transformation. If, you, if you've ever seen a company embark on an agile transformation, whatever even an agile transformation is, um, a, an initiative to increase their business agility, um, they tend to stop after 12, 18, maybe 24 months, right? And for me, that's when you're just getting started. Like it takes this time. You've got to mobilize. You've got to embed these ways of working. You've got to train people. You've got to embed the new culture. And I think you're looking at three to five years uh, before this, be before we really see, and this is a small organization, before we really see this start to pay off. And if we're talking the whole organization, like what Satya Nadella is doing at Microsoft, I mean, it takes even longer, right? So um, the fact that the tenure of many CEOs is uh, shorter than that um, is a problem because as soon as someone new comes in, what do they want to do? They want to make their mark and they want to stamp and then they, they have a reorg. Uh, and then they do this and then everything changes and um, and people get, of course, they get uh, fatigued and they think, oh, well, we'll just sit this change out uh, and it will go away soon enough. And um, yeah, we need a bit, we need stability in the leadership or at least stability in the message. And again, that comes down to the boards of directors, right? Are they, what's the mandate they're giving the new people? Are they trying to keep people for the medium and long term? And if we do have to change, we make sure that the culture and the strategy and all of these things don't get disrupted by that, unless, of course, there's a good reason for them to be disrupted by that. Uh, it's a real problem. And it's not just at senior execs. It's like CIO level. It's like all levels we're seeing this happen, right? Those who drive it don't stick around for long enough to, to see the benefits. It's, it's a massive problem. I'd love to hear if anyone has, has seen a solution to that. Yeah. 
Well, I, I think, and I would add to that is, we also need to resist this urge for instant gratification, especially like given the times that we live in, right? Everything you do you want like instant gratification. If you think about the change of an organization, especially the bigger the organizations are, it's not gonna be, as you mentioned, there's gonna be one, three, maybe not even five years. So a lot of people look at companies like Spotify, look at companies like ING, and we can debate to what extent ING was successful, or look at companies like Hire. And what I love about the example of Hire is it took them decades of experimentation to ultimately build what they have right now. And they're still continuing to, to experiment with their organizational structure, with the metrics that they use, with all the, all the different things that they have in place. So really set this out as, as a leader, I think, um, and as a board, equally important. Be and aware how that- many, How many different uh, iterations did they have, right? They, they went yeah. through, we did this, and then he did this, and then he did this, right? And, and, and you know, Zhang Jimin just really said, like, right, this is important now. And then it's probably about the fifth or sixth reinvention that they've had um, over over decades. And now they're really great, right? But you know, before that, they, they weren't there, right? So, so patience, because it's difficult, right? It's really difficult. You mentioned now they're really great. They're not even like resting on their laurels, which is really important. They, they are now, they've built this habit of constantly reinventing what, what they do and how, how they do things. Now, I noted down a few other questions while, while you were presenting. Um, you mentioned that there are a few things, especially the structures, where leaders have direct control on and others where you can only indirectly impact them. Mm. Um, other than the structures, for example, how you set up teams uh, being more cross-functional or not, what other things do you believe leaders have direct control on? So there, there, there are two, one and a half other ones, right? Because I think I think the governance side of things you can change. These are these are policies that can be changed, right? So instead of you need to have a full-on business case before you get funded, you can spend five hundred pounds, dollars, euros on on an experiment and come back to me, and if if we like what we see, we'll do a VC type funding, right? You can put those policies in place almost overnight if you wanted to, wouldn't recommend doing it overnight, right? But um, so you have direct control over how governance works because these are just rules and can be changed. Mm -hmm. Obviously culture takes a long time to change the people, building engagement and cooperation and collaboration, again, takes a, takes a long time to change. Um, the ways of working, I, I like to see leaders not control that because actually I like to see people doing the work, controlling the ways of working and, and, and be given. Um, and whilst, People do have direct control over that. You don't have direct control over people. So as a leader, you can't. The one you that, that I'm slightly in the middle on is leadership uh, and management styles and behaviors, right? Because whilst in theory, you can change your behaviors, right? it's incredibly difficult to do that. And there's a whole bunch of um, cognitive and emotional capabilities that need to be learned in order to be more of that catalyst leader. And so you, you may want to, you may have the desire uh, and, and the awareness, but you might not have the skill set and the ability to do it straight away. So theoretically you could, and there are definitely some things you could do, but I think that's more of a journey than the others. Mm -hmm. And then the, the next question actually fits in really well from, from Christina. She's picking up on that instant gratification piece that we, that we just talked about and commenting that a lot of leaders are children at heart. I mean, all of us are and how to give them some quick impactful success experiences to help manage their own insecurities on the one hand. And I think also adding to that, make them be willing to go down this longer path mm. that the change actually takes. What kind of maybe short, short term metrics do you see that can give that instant gratification and show them that they're on the right path? Yeah, so I, this is one thing that I never considered for years, right? And I know it's it's part of uh, it's part of Cotter's uh, infamous, well, famous article in HBR, right? Is they're not celebrating short-term wins or not planning for short-term successes. Um, but we, I never did that. And and the place I saw this done incredibly well was working in a bank, uh, a London-based bank, and um, they they actually I've never seen this before. They had a marketing team that was part of that transformation that helped you identify successes. Right? And, and the success didn't have to be like huge commercial success. It couldn't be like our net promoter scores gone up. It's just, you know what? We've got ourselves to the point where we can deploy to production every two weeks, which is huge in a Canary Wharf based bank, right? Um, and let's 
talk about how we can push that message out to everyone to inspire people. And let's, uh, you know, in, with, with newsletters, with presentations, and they actually helped us to disseminate that message, which I'd never seen done. And I thought that was incredibly powerful. Um, and, and it got to the point where it got out and everyone wanted to come and see them working. I don't know what they thought they would see. This is people typing away, but um, you had this kind of safaris where people would come and like interact with the team to talk about that. And we really generated that buzz. And then we started doing it with other things as well, right? So it doesn't have to be, you know, we've created great, this great new product that's bringing in like 500 million in revenue. It can just be, um, we, we can now deploy really quickly or we're now really, we, we've changed our workspaces and we're now much more collaborative. And like, but, but publicizing that is really important because progress builds momentum. Um, I'm a big fan of that. And it's something I ignored for probably longer than I should have, but I, I learned that lesson. And I'm glad I did. So uh, yeah, great. It's a great question. Um, you've, you've got a nothing. Nothing breeds confidence like seeing little small successes frequently. Really yeah, so include some marketing people in your transformation office. Yeah, for, for yeah. internal promotion great. of the efforts. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it, it sounds so so simple once once you think about it. Now the final point, and we're running out of time almost, but I still want to bring up the, this final point. You said there might be. And I'm again paraphrasing efficiency versus agility. And I do see this in a lot of people thinking, okay, you can't be efficient if you want to be agile. You can't be agile if you want to be efficient. Mm -hmm. Personally, I've always looked at this as it depends on what you're looking at. Yeah. If you try to optimize locally, right? If you look at one process and you want to be efficient on that, that might inhibit you from being more agile in general. But if you take a broader perspective, maybe, and I'm putting this as a question to you, efficiency and agility can actually be aligned. Yeah, I, I do agree with you, Sora. But firstly, you, you take good notes. This is, I wish all my uh, people who came to my classes were retained this much. Um, but uh, um, so I, I kind of say this for effect, because what I often see is when we're talking about agile practices, I get from leaders, oh, but that's inefficient. And my, my answer is, well, yeah, efficiency is great if you know exactly what you're doing and you want to do that for as cheaply as possible. If I just need to make like as many Model Ts as I can, awesome, right? But um, actually, if you don't know what you're doing, then you need to try something, get feedback, and then course correct. That, by definition, as a process, is inefficient. But as Deming said, there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently that that should not be done at all, right? So I guess if you look at the high level, however efficient you are, if it's not the right product, that's inefficient. If that makes sense, so exactly. I, I, do, I do take your point um, on, on that one. Um, but you know, largely in terms of how the system operates, and what I say is, democracy is inefficient, right? We spend a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of energy every four or five years choosing our leaders. If we just stuck with one, would be much more efficient, right? But there's something we value more than efficiency when it comes to who runs our country, um, and so we don't do that. So yeah, I take your point. It's a good one. Yeah, cool, Karim. We're out of our time box. Thank you so much for, you. for joining us. I'm sure I'm gonna have, we're going to have you back here at some point. You know, everyone, to. go get the book. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Thank you, Karim. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on.